President Volodymyr Zelensky visited Bakhmut in the very thick of the fighting recently to prove that not only is Ukraine still holding the city, but that they are holding it firmly. Earlier in March, it was believed that Ukrainian troops were beginning to withdraw behind the Bakhmutka River, as vital bridges inside the city were blown up to slow down the advance of the monstrous Wagner Group. Conventional military wisdom would point to a withdrawal, given the seemingly dire tactical situation. Russian forces have encircled the city on three sides, while bringing the last remaining logistics route into close artillery range. Indeed, casualties among the rear lines have been very high for the Ukrainians, as constant indirect fire harasses the vehicles, bringing much-needed supplies in for the city's defenders. However, limited counteroffensives have been launched against the advancing pincers, winning some much-needed breathing room for the heroes of the Logistics Corps, sparking rumors of a larger operation to retake the city completely. Commanding General Sariski has stated that Wagner forces are almost completely exhausted, abandoned by their Kremlin masters, and that potential measures are in place to improve the situation. Evidence seems to support the General's words, as there has been escalating tension between Putin's regime and Wagner PMC over recent months, given the PMC's poor performance in Ukraine. Furthermore, support for the mercenaries from the Kremlin has been noticeably dwindling ever since the public spat about ammunition supplies went viral across social media. It is speculated that Putin is using the Battle of Bakhmut to destroy Wagner Group as a potential threat to his power, or simply to shift attention away from the poor performance of the Russian army. But as we say... That is speculation. What isn't speculation is the fact that Russia has begun to redeploy its best troops away from Bakhmut, including the VDV, in response to potential Ukrainian counteroffensives elsewhere on the front. All of this is irrelevant, however, due to the bravery of our defenders. Even while facing down a ruthless enemy in the ruins of their once proud home, morale among the defenders remains remarkably high, despite the horrendous casualties. And with the visit of the President affirming their efforts, it is now believed that the city may yet stand as the site of yet another tremendous Ukrainian victory. And speaking of victories... Throughout the fierce battles raging across the Donbass, none was more brutal than the Russian assault on the town of Volhedar. As the invader began their winter offensive in this region, the lack of organization and training among their forces was put on full display. Advancing unsupported in column, the enemy's armor ran straight into minefields, forcing them to abandon their vehicles en masse. Yet those were the lucky ones, as more of their comrades ran into a ferocious ATGM ambush from the men and women of the 72nd Motor Rifle Brigade, of which many are Tartar volunteers, striving to liberate their ancestral homeland from the invaders. Over 130 Russian armored vehicles were destroyed in the engagement, along with most of the 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, with casualties numbered at over 500 men. And as though to add insult to injury, Ukrainian forces have confirmed that during those offensives near the town of Kremina, they confirmed the destruction of one of Russia's fated modern superweapons. This BMPT Terminator won't be terminating much of anything anymore, and nor will this one. It is rather fitting that a naval infantry brigade should meet its end at the hands of the Tartars. But in the skies of their beloved homeland, drastic developments unfold. Crisis over the Black Sea. An MQ-9 Reaper drone operated by the United States Air Force was forced down in a ramming attack by a Russian flanker series of fighter jet earlier this month in an act of wanton aggression against the home of the free. The drone was operating in international airspace while monitoring Russian naval and air activity during their ongoing war of aggression against our Ukrainian allies. The Russian fighters made several close passes, venting fuel over the drone in an attempt to force it down. However, it would end up being the incompetence of their aviators that would eventually achieve their objective. As after failing to hit the drone with their vented fuel, the second flanker collided directly with the American aircraft. Russia denies the incident entirely, despite being captured on the film you are now watching. However, OSINT sources reported the Russian Navy search and rescue frequencies being filled with traffic regarding a downed aircraft, leading many to speculate that the Russian aircraft that rammed the drone was lost in the exchange, despite Russia's stringent denials. One interesting piece of information of note is that when analyzing the footage, experts noticed that the missiles mounted aboard the fighter were older models, lacking in the capability they would need to engage NATO aircraft. 
NATO aircraft they would be likely to encounter on a mission in international airspace, leading many to speculate that the Russian Air Force is feeling the strain of the operation that they definitely were not prepared for. And that isn't their only problem. <laughs> The fight for freedom continues not just on the front lines of the Donbass, but deep in the belly of Putin's necrotic empire. Though the mobilization and the propaganda has brought hordes of new bodies for the invaders' ongoing offensive, there are Belarusians and Russians who refuse to be part of the vile tyranny of their leaders, waging a protracted war in the shadows to bring liberation not just for Ukraine, but for all the subjugated peoples of Eastern Europe suffering under a dictator's boot. Belarusian partisans struck Malyushki military airbase outside Minsk in Belarus with a covert drone attack, crippling an A-50 mainstay AWACS aircraft on the apron. The AWACS is the most vital airborne asset for a modern air force. It provides radar coverage over enemy airspace. It offers electronic intelligence gathering capabilities, acts as an airborne command post for aircraft operating in the area, and is one of the most expensive platforms any nation can field. Russia only has 15 of these aircraft in their entire air force, and due to ongoing maintenance issues inside the Russian air forces, along with the sanctions severely limiting the ability to provide spare parts, it is very probable that Russia now only has about 8 or 9 of these aircraft to support air operations over Ukraine, with at least 2 aircraft needing to be airborne at all times to provide full coverage, putting even further strain on an already struggling operation. This is a devastating blow, and a great victory for Belarus's freedom fighters. Yet they are only one part of an ever-escalating partisan campaign currently underway all across Eastern Europe. Ukrainian resistance fighters throughout the occupied territories have been causing absolute havoc behind enemy lines. From the beginning of the invasion until now, there has been nothing but relentless chaos. The evolution of drones, mobile phones, and the extensive proliferations of weapons since mobilization has made the major centers of occupied Ukraine an absolute nightmare for Russian forces to control. The city of Melitopol has seen an extensive number of attacks on both patrols and supply convoys. It is estimated, in fact, that several hundred Russian fatalities are down to the partisans active in Melitopol alone, including high-profile assassinations with targeted car bombs, IEDs, and night ambushes. And since the enemy headquarters has been relocated to the city after the retreat from Kherson, while also being the primary rail hub for southern Ukraine, resistance operations have since escalated severely, including the destruction of a vital rail bridge and constant sabotage of the rail lines across the region. While the port city of Berdyansk, a vital supply hub in Zaporizhia, has seen a concerted IED campaign cause unrestricted chaos among the port facilities and rail hubs, while killing several high-value targets, including Alexei Kishigin, the head of the collaborator government in the region. But Putin has even bigger problems, because the partisan movement has spread beyond Ukraine and the puppet state of Belarus. It has now spread right into the heart of Russia itself. Key strategic targets have been constantly erupting in flames all throughout the country, from Vladivostok to Kaliningrad as Russian partisans ignore mobilization orders and take to the hills. Energy infrastructure has been the primary target, with constant attacks being launched on the oil storage facilities or refineries. Several gas pipelines have also been hit, while at least four military bases have been subject to arson attacks of varying severity. These acts of sabotage have been steadily escalating since the war began, widening to encompass chemical plants, ammunition manufactories, and even a power plant. But their most recent and boldest attack has been a directed assault on the headquarters of Russian intelligence in Rostov. The FSB building in the city was reduced to a blasted, burnt-out husk by a huge explosion that could only have been deliberately caused. And throughout the entirety of the conflict, from February 22 until now, firebombing attacks have been launched on military enlistment offices and draft offices all across Russia every single week in an operation spearheaded by the resistance organization BOAC a movement similar to Antifa in the West, who have been working in coordination with the wider Russian opposition movement and the Ukrainian SBU. But the most aggressive resistance operation throughout Russia and Belarus has been dubbed the Rail Wars. The FSB has been forced to detail security troops to guard railway facilities as acts of sabotage on Russia's railnet have been constant. 
Supplies are struggling to reach forward areas in a timely manner, as rail transport has to proceed at cautious speeds to mitigate the risk of derailing on destroyed track. Partisans have even managed to destroy an entire rail bridge in Kursk Oblast. Since the start of 2023, there have been at least 60 derailments due to sabotage, despite enhanced security measures and extra resources established to repair damaged track. These resistance movements, combined with the free Russian and Belarusian legions serving on the front line, who have since had to expand to regimental size due to large influxes of volunteers, Putin has a serious problem on his hands, and he is lashing out in response. In the town of Yefremov, south of Moscow, a 12-year-old girl is facing institutionalization in a state orphanage while her father is currently under arrest, almost certain to be consigned to the gulag. Young Masha Moskaleva had the local police called down on her by none other than the school she attends for a piece of artwork she drew in her art class. The class is often required by the faculty to draw artwork in support of Russia's special military operation, including portraits of soldiers, tanks driving forward with Z proudly emblazoned on the side. Only Masha had no intention of being party to the crimes of her government, and instead drew a picture of a girl staring down a Russian missile strike with a Ukrainian flag bearing the words, Slava Ukraine. The Russian flag, meanwhile, had written very plainly on it, No to War. The result was immediate, as the school contacted local police, who detained Masha at the premises, while federal security services tracked down her father, subsequently arresting him for the crime of discrediting the Russian armed forces. Masha has since been forced into a children's home, while her father Alexei has been issued with notice that his rights as a parent are to be restricted and most likely removed entirely. Sources close to the scene confirm that he has not even been allowed to speak to his daughter since March the 1st, and it is almost certain that he will be convicted, hence preventing him from seeing or speaking to his daughter until she is an adult. Local townsfolk are enraged and have protested the actions of the government, but all efforts are in vain. Not content with killing Ukrainian children, the Russian state is happy to destroy its own. It's moments like these which makes us understand what's at stake. But fear not, freedom calls, and America has answered. President Biden touched down in Kyiv recently to mark the one-year anniversary of the Russian aggression, a symbolic statement of the United States' continued commitment to the Ukrainian cause and the defense of freedom in the world. In the Commander-in-Chief's own words, it is not just about the freedom of Ukraine, but the freedom of democracies at large. This is a momentous moment, not just in the context of this war, but in the long annals of American history. Throughout the many years and many wars that the nation has fought, at no time has the President held an official visit in an active combat area that wasn't firmly under U.S. military control. This visit comes with a new $3 billion aid package to Ukraine, alongside the arrival of Patriot Missile Air Defense Systems and Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicles into the country, with Ukrainian personnel undergoing operational training on these weapons as we speak. Sources inside the White House and the Pentagon confirmed that the planning and risk assessment for this visit was one of the most intense operations ever mounted by the offices. The President was spirited away in the middle of the night, flown to Poland aboard Air Force One, and completed the journey by rail. No one got any sleep on the journey, according to an anonymous member of staff. Least of all, the Secret Service, who, to use the polite parlance, were having proverbial kittens. Though their fears were not completely unfounded. Even as the president visited Kyiv, the air raid sirens rang out as strikes on targets in western Ukraine continued. The Ukrainian air defense successfully dealt with several threats in the neighboring regions, though having been informed of President Biden's presence in the city earlier in the day, the Russians wisely chose not to hit Kyiv itself, preventing the widening of the conflict. Though it severely disappointed NATO's fighter pilots, I'm sure. The Herculean effort to make this visit a success is a credit to all the parties involved especially the men and women of the United States Secret Service, whose tireless efforts keep our public servants safe. Though, as we mentioned earlier, there is another cadre of silent warriors who have been working even harder. For over a year now, the cornerstone of Ukraine's defense strategy has been its air defense. In the modern battlefield, air superiority is vital to success on the ground. Without it, you are severely limited in your options for destroying enemy fortifications and supporting your ground forces with fast 
and accurate fire support. This environment, combined with the lethality of modern weapon systems, makes breakthroughs a very difficult task. Russia has failed to establish air superiority over Ukraine, despite having the third largest air force on Earth prior to the conflict, and that failure is largely due to the heroism and dedication of the Ukrainian air defenders, who have ensured that Putin's air force is now considerably smaller these days, with over a hundred Russian aircraft confirmed destroyed by independent sources. Since mid to late last year, their efficiency in dealing with Russian air threats forced Putin's henchmen to change their tactics to large-scale cruise missile volleys in conjunction with the extensive deployment of Iranian-made Shahid-136 Kamikaze drones. Yet here, too, the Russians have failed to achieve any significant success. Their stockpile of modern cruise missiles has been steadily depleted over the course of their invasion, forcing them to employ older weapons from the 1960s or to modify anti-ship missiles into a land attack configuration. However, this change of mission has a severely detrimental effect on accuracy, while the older weapons likewise are incapable of precision targeting. Damage to key military installations has been negligible, but attacks on Ukrainian power grids have caused significant disruption to civilian lives and businesses. Even so, the surface to air missile crews of the Ukrainian Air Force, newly equipped with NATO systems, have achieved an 80 to 90% interception rate of incoming threats throughout the Russian missile campaign mitigating the death and destruction caused by the invaders who have been unable to sustain the same volume of attacks in recent weeks. It is suspected that the Russian reserves of standoff weapons are starting to fall dangerously low, while the supply chain of Shahid-136 drones has been interrupted several times due to one of the major production facilities in Iran having been attacked earlier in the year by forces unknown sympathetic to the cause of freedom. Whether the Russian Air Force will be able to continue their offensive operations remains to be seen. But there is one thing we know for sure. Despite over a year of combat, despite being both outnumbered and outgunned, the Ukrainian Air Force is still flying. And since the deployment of the AGM-88 Harm, the ghosts of the Ukrainian skies are on the attack against the Russian frontline air defense, inflicting damage on the surface-to-air missile systems that have so far kept operations on both sides limited. And our aviators just keep getting stronger. Slovakia, a staunch supporter of the Ukrainian air defense since the very early days of the war, have once again come to the fore in their support against the Russian aggression. As the invaders marched on Kyiv under a swarm of fighter aircraft, it was Slovakian S-300s which plugged the gap and forced the enemy aviators to go to ground. Now it will be Slovakian MiG-29s bringing the fight to the Russians, and Ukraine ever closer to victory. Their entire fleet of MiG-29s are scheduled to be sent, comprised of 13 aircraft to be replaced by F-16s in the near future. But of course, they are not alone in this endeavor. Poland has also committed a further four aircraft, with further airframes to be delivered as replacement aircraft from the United States come online. But there may be hope for, as we say in the business, cutting out the middleman, as it has been confirmed that Ukrainian pilots are undergoing preliminary training for F-16s to test the feasibility of fast-tracking Vipers to Ukraine in order to turn this air campaign around properly. With F-16s appearing in the private sector, thousands of maintainers and pilots available for contracts to fight the enemy that they trained their entire careers to fight, there is also the possibility that a ready-made Viper Squadron is not completely out of the question, especially given that the Netherlands is discussing the possibility of lending them theirs. It simply needs the political will to achieve it, which, as always, comes down to you. Yes, you. Phone your congressman. Write to any media you have at your disposal. Only together can we defeat the Russian aggressor. But there are even more ways to help our boys at the front. And so I have to ask you one very important question. Would you like to know more? Reminder to all citizens, the Ukraine Newsreel is here to keep you informed of important developments in Ukraine's struggle for freedom. But victory cannot be achieved without your help. The struggle for democracy needs you. Donate some much-needed war bonds to the charity Come Back Alive or the Ukraine Defense Organization to get our boys the tools to finish the job. And for those who are perhaps uncomfortable with providing weapons, our soldiers still need to eat. Donate to the Frontline Kitchen. You can find the Telegraph connections for these organizations on the lobby notice board below this film. Thank you for watching, and Slava Ukraine!